Good morning. It's so good to see all the beautiful eyes and some of the smiling faces. Uh, and if you guys are joining us online, we're grateful that we hope that this Sunday is a blessing for you. Uh, I love coming to Crossover for two reasons. Uh, I got more than two, but I'll start with two. I know that when I get here, I'll get to hear the Word of God, and I'll get to spend time with the people of God. And, you know, so we look forward to coming every week, and, you know, because I'm human, there's some Sundays where I'm like, oh, I can sleep in, you know. I know church starts at 11, but I can sleep in until, you know, 1, 2 o'clock. Well, my little girl, I have a three-year-old daughter, and if we told her we wasn't going to church, she'd probably start walking. Uh, she loves coming here, so I'm thankful for the kids' ministry here. If you guys got kids, they are doing amazing things. Last week, they had a zoo. So I called some of my friends. I was like, hey, my church got in petting zoo. Does your church got in petting zoo? He's like, no. I was like, my church cooler than yours. But so I came to church excited. I'm about to play with some animals. I got to see a crocodile. And then they say, oh, it's for the kids only. So uh, we got to talk after service, Pastor Ken. I need zoo tickets because the Detroit Zoo is expensive. The St. Louis Zoo is free. So the Detroit Zoo is expensive. So I'm going to need some zoo tickets. But I need you guys to help me out this morning. Um, who is the most famous or influential person you ever know? Like, shout it out. If you guys are online, type it in the comments. Who's somebody that's famous and influential that you've met? You made Michael Jackson? Oh, that's cool. Oh, Ben Carson. Anybody else? Anybody? Obama? Who met Obama? Sam? All right, look at you, Sam. That's my new best friend over there. Uh, for me, the most influential person I had the opportunity to meet was Martin Luther King III. Uh, I grew up reading his father's speeches. I had the I Have a Dream speech memorized, and I tried to copy that slow cadence, and it didn't work out for me. Uh, but if it wasn't for Dr. King, our world would look very different. Not only did he do amazing things here in America, he went overseas and fought for social justice across. And so when, when I found out that his son was coming, I knew getting close to the father, that was as close to the father, as close to Dr. King as I could get, was by meeting the son. And so when I hear like famous people like Michael Jackson or Obama or Dr. King or even Michael Jordan, an athlete, I always ask the question, like, how did they get there? You see, the, these, we love these great players or people because they've done great things around the world. And I always ask myself, like, but how did Michael Jackson become Michael Jackson? How did Obama become Obama? Because originally he wasn't even going to run. Or how did, you know, Dr. King become who he was? And then even looking at scripture, I have that same question. You know, Moses, who, Moses who, uh, Moses who had a stutter, like, he couldn't get words out, and he went to the most powerful man of the land in Egypt and said, all those slaves you got over there, they're my friends. They're coming with me. And it's like, you, you, can, you can't even talk. Like, how did Moses do that and then go on to split a Red Sea? Or Mary, just some little girl. Mary, just some little girl who became the, the mother of Jesus. And like, looking at these stories, they clearly had God's favor. Like, there's no way Moses is splitting that sea on his own, but he had the favor of God. Mary, just some little girl, had the favor of God. One of my favorite stories in all of Scripture is about four boys who were dripping in God's favor. Uh, they were four boys who once were royalty, but then were, was resulted to the life of a slave. This king called Nebuchadnezzar took over their land and took these boys that were once royalty and forced them to a life of slave. Their name is Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Some of us might be familiar with them. Daniel, he, was, he eventually grew up and was known to see visions and translate dreams. Because of his faith and his refusal to bow down to another king, he was thrown into a, a, a pit of lions and was left there to die and walked out like he was just having a sleepover. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because of their refusal to bow down to a false king, were thrown into a furnace and walked out, not even smelling like campfire. These four boys were dripping in God's favor. And I believe that all of us can obtain the favor of God by following their actions, by resolving to do the same things they did. So today we're going to be in Daniel chapter 3. Sorry, Daniel chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 3. Uh, if you don't have your Bibles, the verses are going to be on screen. And if you got the same Bible as me, I'm on page 991. Daniel chapter 1, verse 3 says this. The king ordered Aspenaz, his chief eunuch, 
like his main general, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from the nobility, young men without any physical defect, good-looking, suitable for instruction of all wisdom, knowledgeable and perceptive and capable of serving uh, in the king's palace. He was to teach them the Chaldean language and literature. The king assigned them daily provisions from the royal food and wine that he drank. They were to be trained for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to attend to the king. Among them from the Judaites were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. The chief eunuch gave them names. He gave the name Belteshazzar to Daniel, Shadrach to Hananiah, Meshach to Mishael, and Abednego to Azariah. We can see in this life, the first thing that these boys resolved to do was they resolved their identity. They resolved who they were. Better yet, whose they were. They knew regardless of what... See, names during this time had significant weight. Daniel and the other boys, without diving too deep into their names, were reflections of God. They were, they were named in worship of God. And it was common practice that when you conquered a land and you took slaves, you would change their name. How many of y'all saw Roots? I don't know why the Detroit public school system thought it was a good idea to play Roots for second and third graders, but we watched the whole series, One Black History Month, and that image of Kutsa Kinte up on a pole getting beat saying, your name is Toby. He's like, no, my name is Kutsa Kinte. And over and over and over again, that image is seared in my head. These boys said, regardless of what someone else may call me, I know who I am. Uh, Over the past few weeks, we've been in a series called Identity. And the whole point of that identity is those of us that have a relationship with Christ, our identity is him. When God looks at us, he sees Jesus. I found myself recently in an awkward situation. Someone was unfortunately on social media, and they were talking about me in a negative way and kind of essentially giving me slanderous names. And it was just, like, it was super awkward. But it's like, regardless of what this person may have called me, I know what my name is. And when you know who you are, you walk a little bit different. When I was a kid, I was occasionally got in a little trouble at school. And I remember my dad sitting me down and going, what's your name? I'm like, oh, I know what my name is. What's your name? Michael Jerome Howard II. He said, you have my name. And we don't act like that. And I, I was like, man, I'm never going to be like this. I'm never going to be like my parents. And my daughter was uh, being a little less than delightful a couple weeks ago. And I sat her down and said, Isabella doesn't act like that. Isabella Howard doesn't act like that. See, when you know who you are, regardless of what someone else calls you, you walk a little bit different. Uh, we, there's a song that we commonly sing. I can't think of the name of the song off the top of my head. Uh, but the theme of this song goes uh, something along like, I'm a, a, a sinner saved by grace. Uh, you guys heard that song before? I'm going to let you know a little secret. It's not in the Bible. And that's not true. We're not a sinner saved by grace. See, when we are in Christ, when we have a relationship with Christ, he doesn't look at us as a sinner saved by grace. He gives us a new name. Corinthians talks about he makes us a new creation. And so we're no longer a sinner saved by grace. We are a saint. So when we talk about resolving your identity, would you rather be known as a sinner saved by grace or a saint who sometimes sins? You know, if I, I'll put you back, like what, if you had a choice today, a sinner, that's your identity. So when you walk out of here, Man, I, you know, I'm a sinner, and, and I sin, and this is who I am. But that's not how God calls you. That might be what everybody else calls you. That might be what the world calls you, but that's not how God sees you. God sees you as a saint. And because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, we can walk out of here as saints and no longer sinners. The second thing that these boys resolve to do is to obey. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or the wine he drank. So he asked permission from the chief eunuch not to defile himself. One of a uh, different translation I really love, it uses the word resolve. Daniel resolved 
not to defile himself with the king's food. That word resolve is not a common word that we use regularly, and it means to decide or determine beforehand. Decide beforehand what your course of action would be. See, in this, in this passage, it doesn't sound like much because it's like, man, they're just trying to feed you, Daniel. Like, you're a slave. Be thankful that you're eating the same food that the king is, right? If I was Daniel's friend, I'm like, shut up. This is a great cookout. We slaves. But Daniel said, well, this food, it was common practice that this food was sacrificed to idols. And by eating that food, by going to that cookout and eating off that table, you were worshiping idols. Daniel decided to say, hey, you might call me Belteshaz, whatever, but my name is Daniel, and I will not worship a false god. I will not eat from this table because I know who I am. Daniel resolved to obey God. The question is, what is God asking you to do? Uh, there was a wise guy who said, um, we all have more scripture in us than what we practice. That's Pastor Ken. Uh, <laughs> We all have more scripture in us than what we practice. So a lot of times we're like, well, I'm just waiting on the Lord to tell me what to do. It's like, well, he already, he already told us, you know? Maybe he told you to forgive that person that you're holding resentment on. You don't need any more revelation than to forgive that person. He said, forgive others. So forgive the person. You know, maybe there's some things in your life that God's calling you not to do. And in obedience, you're like, ah, I can't do that. You know, maybe there's some things that you're looking at that God said, hey, don't defile yourself with that. Or maybe there's some things that you're saying that God's like, hey, even though they cut you off in that car and even though that your supervisor is treating you bad, you shouldn't walk behind their back and talk trash about them. You need to not defile yourself with what you say. Maybe there's some places that we're walking in that we shouldn't be in as a believer because of what could happen. And so, when Daniel resolved, when he knew who he was, he resolved to obey. And in obedience, he knew, I'm going to determine beforehand. Before I get in a situation, see, I found myself in some situations where I knew I shouldn't have been at. Uh, anybody else? Is that just me? Um, and I was just wondering life and just living life how Michael wanted. And then I'm in this situation and going, oh, snap, what do I do now? But the better, you know, I use this phrase, um, proactive versus reactive. And in that situation, I was reacting to my circumstances. Uh, See, being proactive, you know, if you're driving down the road and sometimes people slam on their brakes because we are in Detroit and we drive 90 miles an hour in a 55, but to be proactive is making sure that you have space between you and the car in front of you so that when that car slams on its brakes, you can just get out the way or you have time to brake. Being reactive is why we have so many car accidents, because you're riding on that bumper, because we're all going 90, and they slam on that brakes, and then you end up in an accident because you were in a spot that you should not have been in. Being proactive, resolving to obey God, is deciding beforehand, before you ever get in the mess, that you're going to obey Him. Recently, I was at a a hip-hop event. I'm going to, don't judge me, but I, I listen to battle rap. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but it's a friend of mine's a Christian hip-hop artist, and I went to this event to support him. And I got there, and I kind of, it was supposed to be in Flint, and so I kind of knew a little bit of the situation I was walking into, and so I called my wife when I pulled up, and I said, hey, just letting you know, I might smell a little funny when I get home, but I'm good. But the thing is, I knew the situation I was going into, and I was with another friend, and we were there to support this local Christian artist. And so there's things that we resolved in ourselves, like, hey, we're not going to do those things. And, and when certain things got passed around the table, they skipped over me because they knew, like, oh, Michael's not, like, that's not who he is, so we're not even going to bring that up to him. See, when, you know, when people know who you are, when you have your identity resolved, and you made a choice before you ever get in that situation to obey God, temptation is just going to go past you. Because it knows, like, ah, it won't work against Michael, so we're going to have to go to the next person. The third thing that these guys decided to do was to trust. They resolved themselves to trust. Verse 8, Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food, with the wine he drank, so he asked permission from the chief eunuch not to defile himself. Verse 9, God granted Daniel kindness and compassion from the chief eunuch. He said to Daniel, I fear the Lord my king who assigned you food and drink. 
What if he sees your face looking thinner than the other young men your age? You would endanger my life with the king. So Daniel the, said to the guard, whom the chief eunuch had assigned to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Daniel knew that, hey, I'm going to trust God. I know I can't eat this food because it's idol worship. I'm going to trust God that God's going to take care of us. So he said, hey, you're not, he told the chief eunuch, test us. He wasn't really saying, test us. He's saying, I trust in God, so you can test me because I know God's got it. Verse 12, please test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink, and then examine our appearance uh, of the young men who are eating the king's food and deal with your servants based on what you see. He agreed with them about this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, they looked better and healthier than all the young men who were eating the king's food. So the guard continued to remove their food and the wine that they were given to drink and gave them vegetables. Verse 17. God gave these four men knowledge and understanding of every kind of literature and wisdom. Daniel also understood visions and dreams of every kind. In this moment, Daniel decided to trust God. He decided to trust in the promises of God. I mentioned I got a little three-year-old, and we were getting ready to sign her up for class at the beginning of this year. And, I, you know, all through the pandemic, I kept saying to other parents, like, oh, I'm glad I don't have a school-aged child because, you know, I don't have to deal with this because I don't have to worry about my kids going to school during a global pandemic. They're at home with my wife. They're safe. I, I, it was the farthest thing from my mind. And then we, get, we fill out their applications for them to go to school, and I'm thinking, oh, they're going to start in September. Then we get this email and say, oh, your kids start school in two weeks. I'm like, no, they do not. <laughs> I looked at my wife, and she's like, oh, they get to start school. I'm like, no, not my kids. And I looked at her and I said, I'm not ready. I wasn't ready for my little girl to go to school. And then I found out my son's going too. And I'm like, I'm definitely not ready for both of them to leave the house because I was, I was scared. I was worried, man, what if somebody's going to pick on my daughter? What if somebody's going to bully my daughter? She's super sweet. If somebody bullies my daughter, I might, have to, I might have to change that identity real quick. But what if she has eczema? What if a kid started picking on her because of her skin or because or of her hair? What if somebody pushes her on the playground? All these fears that I haven't had to deal with before were coming to the surface. On top of that, my kids are going to school in a global pandemic. And it's like, man, then I heard this voice, do you trust me? And I'm like, uh, I'm hearing things. I ain't really, again, do you trust me? And I said, hey, you talk, all, you talk a big game, but do you trust me to take care of your kids? And if you do, then let them go to school. It's that simple, like being obedient, resolving to obey, resolving to trust, is just allowing my daughter to go to school. And we're grateful that we did because, I mean, man, she, her teachers are amazing. My son's teachers are amazing. But the thing is, I, it, was a, it was a moment in time where I had to choose. Am I going to trust in the promises of God or not? All throughout my life, I can stand up here and go story after story after story about times where I trust in the promises of God. Uh, when I was in college, um, my mom got sick and she was ended up in the hospital and we didn't know what was going on. And so I was at home with my little brothers at the time and I wasn't working. I had no money. That doesn't mean the bills stop when the money stops. And I needed, I needed, I needed money for our car note. I didn't have it. I get a phone call and I'm expecting, you know, churches when somebody gets sick, they like to bring you groceries and all that. So I'm expecting somebody just bringing us food. I get a phone call and said, Hey, meet me at the bowling alley. You know, I'm like, okay, whatever. Like, I'm still stressed out about my car note, but I knew that God was going to take care of it. So I show up at the bowling alley, and this person just gives me an envelope and says, hey, God told me to give you that. And so I walk off, and I look. I'm like, oh, this is exactly what I needed to cover my car note. It's because I resolved to trust God. And story after story, like all throughout my life, God's promises are true. And so what is the area in your life that you're holding on to? Maybe it's family. Maybe you got a kid and they're kind of living a different lifestyle than what you would prefer and that they're out in the world and you're like, do you trust God with that child? Maybe your marriage isn't like, you know, these fake marriages on the TV screen. I mean, Bill and Melinda Gates are breaking up and this is like viral news, right? 
you know, like, you know, like they're not people. But maybe an area that in your life, man, my marriage doesn't look like what I want it to look like. Are you going to let it go and trust God in that? Or maybe your job. I mean, we are in a global pandemic and finances are tight. Maybe your job, maybe your financial situation isn't as stable as you would like it to be. Are you going to trust God in that? At the, at the top of this year, um, I, you know, New Year's resolutions, and I'm not big on New Year's resolutions because you set them January 1 and you break them January 2. But this year, I was like, this year is going to be different. And it wasn't except for the most part. Um, but at the beginning of the year, one of the things that I wanted to do, one of my resolutions, one of my resolves was to be generous. And I like to think myself as a generous person, but I grew up relatively poor, and some of you guys might identify with that, ups and downs, you know, and I never was able to, like, financially generous with people. And so I'm, you know, seeing Oprah, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car. I'm like, I want to do that, I want to do that. I'm like, well, I don't even have a car to give away. (laughs) But I said at the beginning of this year, I don't care what, like, somehow we're going to be financially generous this year. And so at the top of the year, I had this opportunity, this guy who was starting a clock-making business, and he needed a 3D printer to make this clock. And so I was like, uh-huh, I'll, I'll give it to him. And in that, because I knew that even though we didn't have it, that God was going to provide. It wasn't me giving this clock away or this machine away. It was God just using me to do it. And so I trusted God in obedience. And from that moment, God has been our favor. His favor has just been poured out on us. And uh, so at the beginning of this year, I said, you know what? Anytime I'm in a situation where... I don't particularly like it. Um, Like I mentioned earlier, someone publicly was saying some negative things about me uh, on social media. I resolved to myself, man, when someone treats me bad, what I'm going to do is go be generous to someone else. Um, I was at this Loves, and this dude was following me around the store as an employee, yelling at me and following me around, asking me, are you even going to buy something? I'm like, first off, I came here to shop. You work here. Leave me alone. But, you know, obviously he... uh, didn't think I was going there to spend any money, so he was following me around the store. And, and even this other situation, this person publicly lied on me on social media and, and said some things about me and even insinuated that I treated her poorly because of the color of our skin. I'm like, have you seen my wife? You know what I'm saying? Like, come on now. But because I felt, and at that time, I really got in my feelings because I run a woodworking business and she left a negative review on our business page. So I was really in my feelings because we had a perfect record. I'm like, so I'm calling my best friend. I'm like, hey, man, can you do something about this lady? Because I can't. But God in that moment said, hey, remember that resolve you said? If someone treats you some kind of way, like turn around and be generous. So I'm scrolling through Facebook angry because this lady is losing her mind on Facebook. And I see this this, uh, business card of this young guy. He was starting a garage door business. And so I just said, hey, man, what do you need for your business? Call me. I just felt like that's what God told me to do. And so I call him, and he's like, oh, I need, I need some tools to get started and all of this. And so I'm like, okay, cool. Um, come over to the house. I have some extra tools, like some that I don't use. I'll give them to you. And so he was planning on coming, but while I was on my way home, I heard God say, don't give him used stuff because I wouldn't give you anything that's someone's leftovers. God, God doesn't give me leftovers. Why would I give one of his children leftovers? So I went to the store, and I bought new tools, and when the guy came over, surprised him with new tools. And I'm like, man, when I was at that store, and I was at that checkout lane, and, you know, this was my card, and I'm like, all right, because uh, it was a, a little bit more than what I was willing to spend, you know. It went from free to uh, not free real fast. And, and so I'm like, all right, you know, God, you said you were the provider, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So I knew that I'm going to resolve to trust in him, and he'll take care of the back end. So I get home, this guy comes over, I give him the tools, and he leaves. Um, and, well, while he's there, he says this. He's like, Michael, I prayed for these tools, and, you, and then you called me. So, I mean, he trusted in God, that God is his shepherd, he shall not be want. And that guy's prayers got answered because we have a God who answers our prayers. I just happen to be a part of it. And so I go upstairs to talk to my mom after this event, and this dude from Georgia that I've barely talked to 
say, hey, I saw something on social media. I want to send you $200 to go help support this guy. And I'm like, man, look at God. This train of trust, this train of obedience, because when we resolve to trust God, he will always fulfill his promises. You know, this favor that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were dripping in, I believe we all can obtain God's favor. When we resolve our identity in him, when we resolve to obey him, and when we resolve to trust him. The last thing that you see these four guys do is they resolve to surrender. A couple times I've talked about, you know, Jesus and what he did on the cross. The Bible is really clear. It says, Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. For Michael has sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And because of Michael's sin, the Bible is clear that the wages of sin is death. Just like when I work my business or I work my job, I get a paycheck. When we sin, there's an outcome. And that outcome is a separation between us and God. My favorite word in all of Scripture. But, for the wages of sin is death. But, the gift of God is life through Christ Jesus. And it's simple. Uh, the, one of, the Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ raised from the dead, you shall be saved. If you confess, you shall be saved. If you confess, you shall be saved. Today, we have an opportunity to resolve who we are in this moment. Are we going to walk out these doors as a sinner? Are we going to walk out these doors as a saint? What is our identity? Are we going to resolve in ourselves for our identity to be a sinner? Because we're making a choice in this moment. Our choice is either to be a sinner and walk out these doors or to be a saint and walk out these doors. To resolve to be disobedient or to resolve to be obedient. To resolve not to trust God or resolve to trust God. The most important thing is to resolve to surrender and everything else will take care. You want God's favor? The favor that Daniel had that closed the mouths of lions? The favor that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had that pushed back the fires of life, the favor that Moses had that split the sea and freed us from slavery, freed the Hebrews from slavery, the favor that some little girl had that eventually would bore the Savior of our world. That's the kind of favor I want to walk out of here with. That's the kind of life I want to live. That when I walk into a place, people know that I am in Christ, that I am obedient to God, that I trust him, and I live a life of surrender. But it all starts with you giving your life to Jesus Christ. Confess and believe. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the cross. Thank you for paying the debt that I couldn't even attempt to work at. I thank you for changing my dirty clothes, my filthy rags, my good works with your life. I thank you for it's not about what I do, but about what you did for us on the cross. I pray that as we leave here, we leave here as new creations with our identity wrapped up in you so that when the world sees us and when God sees us, they see you through us. And I pray for your favor as we strive to be identified with you, as we strive to obedience, as we strive to trust you, as we strive to surrender, I pray for your favor. Your favor to protect us from the fires of life or the lions that are hiding and waiting. I pray for favor amongst people and supervisors and kings and presidents. But ultimately, I pray that we live a life surrendered into you. In Jesus' name.